Welcome to the CEC report for the 8th of May 2015. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is CEC Re researcher and political organiser Glenn Isherwood. Welcome Glenn. Thanks Elisa. And on today's CEC report, will Greece EU showdown trigger new GFC? And Australia must join China's credit economy. So firstly, will Greece EU showdown uh, Will Greece EU showdown trigger new GFC? Now, we put out a press release this week entitled European Debt Brinkmanship is Sword of Damocles over Global Financial System. And the reason for that is that this coming Monday, the European Union finance ministers will be meeting to discuss whether they will uh, give more funds to Greece or even whether they will continue giving the emergency funding that they've been doing on an emergency or a transition basis. And of course, the Greek government has stated very firmly that their absolute red line in the sand, their deep and immovable red line is the way they put it, uh, is that they will not cease to return uh, the wages back up to acceptable levels, the wages of workers, yep. and also pensions. And also they will no, not go back to the kind of bone crushing austerity that had been enforced upon them. But those of course are the conditions that the, the EU and the IMF and the European Central Bank, the Troika as it's known, are demanding. Yeah, people so will remember Elisa that that was the mandate on which this government was elected. Exactly. That uh, they cannot afford to capitulate on these fundamental points mm. that got them elected and got all the other parties in Greece who compromised with the Troika and these austerity conditions got them thrown out on their asses. Exactly. Um, so this is going to be a standoff of some kind. And of course, the great concern is that Greece will not back down and they will call the bluff of the Troika and basically say, no, we're going to step back from this process, whether that means a debt moratorium, whether that means withdrawing, of course, from the euro. And uh, one figure who expressed this the other day was Hung Tran and he's the Executive Managing Director of the Institute of International Finance and that body by the way it's called the Bankers Cartel and it comprises nearly 500 of the world's largest financial institutions which includes Australia's big four banks Macquarie Bank and the Future Fund so it's no small fry and he told the London Telegraph on the 2nd of May that the consequences of a Greek exit would be complex and were not fully understood and that a Greek exit would quote throw the Eurozone block into chaos unquote and he went on to say that the main issue here is quote there's a whole range of political ramifications in terms of market expectations if the euro pre proves to be reversible in other words you can withdraw from it he said the natural question is who will be next, mm. i.e. who will leave next if Greece leaves. Yeah. They would love, they'd love for this EU to be a, a, a room in which you can throw people in and lock the keys so no one can get out. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> you can't leave. But um, we talked in the press release, of course, about the implications worldwide of this mm. and in particular for Australia. And one of the factors to which Australia is heavily exposed is, of course, derivatives. And we've talked about derivatives a lot before on the show, so people should have a general idea of that. But look at it from a banker's standpoint mm. from a moment because they view derivatives as the insurance policy of their risky investments. So they take out an insurance policy to insure their positions but that insurance policy is taken out with another bank. So of course if that other bank happens to be in trouble as occurred in 2008-2009 they no longer trust each other and that's why during 2008-09 you had a very extended period where there was no, literally no interbank lending that took place because none of the banks trusted each other. So that's called counterparty risk and after 2008, after the GFC, uh, according to experts who've written about this, banks were told that they had to take out an insurance on their counterparty risk. Mm. So they're being told to take out an insurance on their insurance <laughs> or more derivatives on their derivatives in other yeah. words. So this is one of the reasons why there's been an explosion of growth in derivatives since the GFC mm. and including in Australia. Yeah, at least with what's happening in Greece, 
uh, I think it's important that we realize that this is not a crisis that's facing the Greek population as much as it is a crisis that's facing the financial world. Mm. Uh, people may remember, I mean, the older viewers will remember that in 1998 there was a similar default on Russian bonds, the GT mm. GKO crisis yep. in Russia, uh, where the, the, the bonds of Russia were defaulted and it caused massive crisis in these derivatives then. So we've had warnings of what can happen in these markets over, over many, many years. Uh, so what's happening now is there's a panic in these circles that the speculation, the, the, vault, the, the vulture and vampire-like activity that these bankers were embellishing in, in, in speculating on, on risky bonds, trying to use the crisis in Greece to make a profit, now it's coming back to haunt them because they realize that if Greece does not um, pay and go with austerity and meet these payments and walks away from the table, mm, mm. well, that's actually for Greece. It's a position of power they're in yeah. against these desperate uh, uh, people who are trying to uh, secure their, you know, their ill-begotten gains. Mm. So what Greece is, is now doing is, is turning to the turning eastward uh, and is looking mm. towards the BRICS countries, Russia, uh, Brazil, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, this new alliance, uh, because there is a different, uh, different political and economic policy uh, where they're not seeking like the, the free trade of London and Wall Street to extract profits. Mm, exactly. And in fact, um, Alexis Tsipras, the Prime Minister of Greece, will be going to St. Petersburg in June and in the local media in Greece it's generally being discussed mm. that he will probably apply for a loan from the New Development Bank, which is the bank created by the BRICS nations. Um, you also had the discussion coming from the Energy Minister Lafazanis who said that they would not just be borrowing this money in order to pay back debt, but that they want to become a major hub of China's One Belt, One Road concept by, quote, following an alternative strategy that's beyond the dogma of Euro-Atlantic subjugation. And he spoke of Greece being a link between three continents, Europe, Asia and Africa, which was borne out actually by a 29th April meeting where the President of Cyprus, of Greece, the Greek P PM, I should say, and the Egyptian President El Sisi uh, signed agreements to strengthen their cooperation uh, in economic joint projects, maritime connections. And if we put up a map, you'll see um, the port of um, Piraeus in Greece is the closest port in the northern Med Mediterranean to the Suez Canal. And Chinese Premier Li Keqiang described it as China's gateway to Europe. Um, so this can be, as the Deputy Prime Minister Yanis Dragosakis told Politico, uh, a strategic development partnership with China. And he said in the context of the New Silk Roads initiative, there are infrastructure projects which are of a common interest. Mm. So there's a lot developing in this direction. And after the break, we're going to talk a bit more about exactly what it is that Greece is allying with here in the BRICS. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Australia must join China's credit economy. Now, this week in Australia, we saw another interest rate cut, which has brought down our interest rates to another historic low of 2%. And remembering, too, that this is a full 1% below the so-called emergency levels of 2009. Oh. Now, the advice that Joe Hockey had, our treasurer for the country, whether you be an individual or a business, is to spend up big. But we're going in this segment, we're going to look at why that is completely wrong. It's not going to work. What he's talking about is a drop in the bucket compared to what we need to actually spend at a national level if we want our economy to get back on track. Now, what people may not realise is that since the GFC, post-2008-2009, China has saved all of our behinds. We are actually only still here, the entire world, because of the spending of China. Especially for Australia with our iron ore mm. export. Yeah. And so if you look at what China has done historically since 2008, they have been the only country that has really created new credit and poured it into actual building and productive enterprise and infrastructure as compared to quantitative easing 
uh, which of course has been trillions of dollars, but it's all gone into banks and to fill the black holes of the losses, the specul speculative losses. Um, so China's money's been going into infrastructure. We're just going to watch a very brief clip given by uh, EIR editor on economics, Paul Gallagher, from our March 28th to 29th international conference. As I mentioned earlier, the Federal Reserve printed four trillion in QE programs, purely building four trillion dollars, purely building up major banks' deposits and excess reserves for purposes of speculation. This newly printed money does not enter the economy through bank lending. It merely drives up the value of assets held by financial institutions and traded among them. But the state banks of China have issued credit, uh, if you like, printed money, at the rate of $4 trillion equivalent per year since 2009, in the range of $20 trillion in total leveraging even China's huge credit uh, currency reserves by five times. And the vast majority of this world historical credit flow has not been for their private banks, but for every other sector of their economy. So it is a considerable understatement to say that China has been the only economy in the world which has maintained its growth through the crash and collapse. It has maintained the world's growth the world's demand for machinery and commodities and new technologies. China used, between 2011 and 2013, that is in three years, as much cement, and this is considering only high-quality grades of cement, as the United States used in the entire 20th century, about four gigatons, four billion tons. Scores and scores of new cities were built of over one million people each. Hydroelectric and water management projects on a very large scale. Incredible transport and port development. Two-thirds of all the construction cranes in use in the world. China built, between 2006 and 2014, a 16,000-kilometer network of high-speed rail lines, larger than Europe's entire high-speed network, equal to all the rest of the high-speed rail in the world, and is building another 10,000 kilometers now. We don't need to discuss the development of its space and fusion energy programs during those same few years. Yeah, Lisa, that's quite incredible. Mm. You see those figures. I mean, I actually didn't know that China, in just two years, a, t a period of two years, had used that much concrete. Mm. I mean, we, th we re look back to the... Uh, the New Deal policy of Roosevelt, the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, extraordinary dam construction. China has uh, has excelled and gone way beyond what I think all of our viewers would really appreciate mm. in terms of scale and magnitude mm. of development here. Yeah, and extraordinary. We want to look at now what's possible because China's going now beyond just its own entity and is looking, at, you know, it's a part of this BRICS concept with its collaborating nations and beyond the BRICS that they're working with many other nations to bring this to the entire world on a much grander scale. And this is exactly what we need to do. So I want to take a look, quick look at the various banks that are being set up. There's a whole plethora of these banks to fund development, starting with the um, One Road, One Belt concept of the new Silk Road, but going way beyond to a worldwide conception. Um, so you have, first of all, the new development bank of the BRICS nations, which um, will start off being about $100 billion as a fund. You have the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which we're part of, that's another $100 billion. The Silk Road Development Fund at $40 billion. The new Maritime Silk Road Fund at $20 billion. The Contingency Reserve Arrangement at another $100 billion. And you have a number of Chinese policy banks, like their Export-Import Bank, um, which China's just announced a couple of weeks ago that they're going to sink an extra $62 billion uh, into that. And just as an example, um, the largest of the Chinese policy banks, the Chinese, uh, sorry, the China Development Bank, they've put more money into investment in infrastructure in Africa in the last six years than the World Bank the African Development Bank and the Asian Development Bank put together. So this is a new injection of funds into that, those number of banks. Mm -hmm. And finally, you have the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation, another new bank uh, estimated to be around $100 billion. Um, So 
this basically is taking the model that China took to do what most countries would take 100 or 200 years to do and it completely in industrialise and develop themselves and which China did in the recent 30 years. But Australia really should have a key position to play in this because we are one of the few countries in the world with real experience in pioneering this kind of approach of using nationally created credit to build an economy. And what would be the case? Just think about what could be possible if Australia ditched Joe Hockey's approach of a little pittance, a trickle in the buckle of a bucket of a little bit of extra mm. spending because of lower interest rates to taking this approach. Mm. Well, th this is uh, the optimism that it lays before us. I mean, we have, uh, we have the history, the great rich history of what King O'Malley did in establishing the original Commonwealth Bank. The credit uh, is... We know how to issue the credit to do it. And the CEC, Elisa, as you know, we have produced since 2002 blueprints of development. And I mean, because we're talking about the Maritime Silk Road, uh, I think the focus on Australia, Australia's northern development is mm. the most uh, key thing here. Because we have, you know, lots of cities that are, you know, towards the south. Um, we've got a tyranny of distance. What we need to focus on is high-speed rail corridors up to the north of Australia and then using uh, to link into this maritime silk road of China. Um, we could use maglev uh, train technology. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, China's announcing that it's going to be producing another uh, maglev train line. Japan is breaking records of new high speeds in maglev. And what we can do is from places like Darwin and north of Queensland, where there's huge abundance of water, we can uh, run in parallel to these transport uh, programs, uh, new water development programs, build more dams, and start to populate the north of Australia, which is right now empty. Mm. I mean, that's one of the biggest troubles Australia faces right now is uh, the lack of population. Mm. But um, we've got the history and the precedent to do this, and we and China is looking for collaborators in this part of the world, as Helga Zeppler-Rusch said, and and others have said uh, Australia is a, a critical part to this. Mm, absolutely. And if you haven't already called in, um, do so, and we'll send you a copy of that publication that Glenn referenced with all the development projects that we could get going with now. They don't need to be on the drawing board any longer. And we'll stop there, and after the break, we'll talk about what is China's agenda in all this. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC Report and we're discussing why Australia must join China's credit economy. Now, I want to discuss why China is taking this approach. Why are they putting money into so many other countries and investing? You know, because some people, of course, have the idea and it's spread a lot here in Australia that China wants to take over the world. But that is not the truth. And I want to start by playing a short clip from the speech given by Helga Zeppelarouche, the president of the Schiller Institute internationally, to our March 28th to 29th international conference. The two most fundamental conceptions of Confucianism is on the one side Ren, which means ben ben benevolent government, uh, which Confucius says is means to love people. In the Christian uh, philosophy, it's called agape, uh, which means politics has to be based on love. And that was also, by the way, the idea of the Peace of Westphalia, that you have to act in the interest of the other if you want to have peace. The second most important or equally important principle of Confucianism is Li. Now, Li means that each person and each thing must take its place in the universe and develop in the best possible way. And if all people and all things do that and develop the potential which is embedded in them, then you have harmony in the system. Now, that is exactly what Xi Jinping means when he says we have to have a win-win policy. Uh, so the new paradigm, therefore, must assume one humanity, a co the common interest of the uh, human species as it is defined by the ontological order of the physical order of creation, of the physical universe, 
or cosm the cosm, as the Indians would say. So, Glenn, this is a really stunning similarity, really, with the traditional concept of Confucianism and the concepts of Christianity. Mm. Um, can you say a bit more about that? I know you've done some work on this subject area. Well, I mean, Confucius um, lived um, in ancient times, mm. and he, in a sense, was like the Christ figure in Western civilization. But what happens is, I mean, Confucian ideas become, you know, one uh, one of the most important f uh, fi uh, principles for economy. Um, it towards around the 1100 AD mark, where China undergoes a physical economic renaissance. Um, and I think mm. another point that Helga has made is that China today mm. is more Confucian than it is communist. Yeah. And that's important because what um, led to uh, Western civilization's emergence was um, the science of physical economy, the discovery of creative principles and social principles that allowed for the improvement of the cognition and man's discoveries. Mm. And in China, I mean, in, uh, it was the Confucian tradition that led to the development of, of you know, paper printing, paper, you know, uh, gunpowder, which, I mean, despite its destructive uses, also had incredible productive uses in, in engineering and, and uh, development. I mean, shipbuilding. I mean, this, this uh, civilization has contributed an incredible amount. And now we see a resurgence of this great era in China's history. And it's all focused on this idea of um, the advantage of the other. Mm. In Confucian terms, what they call reciprocity. Hmm. The, the principle of Ren, which uh, Helga referred to, of benevolence or agape, mm. as it's known in the West, of love for mankind. This is the, you know, the primary uh, consideration, even in physical economy. I mean, you don't start with this uh, Darwinist survival of the fittest mm. mentality where you've got to squash the other person, but uh, you know, the idea of rising tide lifts all boats. Mm, not buy cheap, sell dear. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you mentioned the Treaty of Westphalia, or the Westphalian tradition, and of course that was the basis for international relations mm -hmm. um, today. And of course the Westphalian Treaty 1648 ended a hundred years of essentially permanent warfare. But it was also based on the Christian tradition, which was uh, elaborated by a Catholic cardinal, Nicholas of Cusa, who brought together the Eastern and Western churches uh, in 1439, in particular with the Council of Florence. But he developed the idea that government, for one thing, must be representative. Um, and he actually said that um, every governance can only come from the agreement and consent of the subjects, which in the 1400s, uh, in the middle of the Dark Age, yeah. was a pretty profound concept. Mm -hmm. And he developed that idea, which is, again, similar to the Confucian idea, that of concordance, that there has to be a concordance between the macrocosm, which is the big, the universe, and the microcosm, yeah. which is the cognitive powers of man, and that each individual is responsible to develop the powers of the other individual or nation to the yeah. maximum degree. Yeah, the idea that this is every person's... Uh, personal duty and responsibility mm. to look out for the common good was very much at the centre of Confucian thought. Exactly. And so this is really the spirit that is animating not only China but the whole BRICS uh, block and of which Australia must join and take part. And what I wanted to ask everyone of our viewers to do is go to our website and download the petition that we've written to the Australian Parliament calling on Australia to join with the BRICS nations. So you'll see that on the screen. Thanks for tuning in to the CC Report and join us again next week. Mm -hmm.